Okay, I just hit the record button. So this meeting is being recorded. Um, thanks everyone for calling in. Like I said, I'm Erica Bierbauer. I am posting the call in place of Rich, who is traveling today. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, this meeting today is just a general meeting. And as we always do in the beginning, uh, we're going to go through the um, reading of the Linux Foundation antitrust policy. Um, we're not actually gonna read it, but um, here is the slide that, as Rich always says, just be a good person is basically what this slide is saying. And if you want more information, you can read it. And the link is on the general meeting page. Um, I'd like to start out with, if there's any new members to the group, um, can we please have you introduce yourself at this time? I can start. Hey everyone, I'm Ankit Jain. I am not necessarily new to the group, but I have been joining intermittently, serving as proxy for Ravish Devan on behalf of the Payer subgroup today. Oh, great. Thank you so much for, for joining um, on behalf of him. And where are you located? I'm located in Columbia, Maryland. Great. Good morning, everyone. And is there anyone else? Um, I'm not, uh, I'm seeing a few names that aren't super familiar to me, but I'm just substituting here, so I'm not sure who's new and who's not. Uh, but if there's anyone else who would like to introduce themselves or uh, give an update on what they're working on, um, that would be great. So this is uh, Jonathan Holt. I'm not, also not new. I've been uh, lurking for the past uh, year and a half. I'm a clinical geneticist and biomedical informaticist by training. I live in Chicago. I'm the chair of the Internet Identity, um, sorry, the Identity Healthcare subgroup of the IEEE, and um, I'm mostly uh, work on uh, genomics applications of blockchain technologies, but mostly that's centered around identity and encrypted data stores. Oh, great! That's very interesting. I am also in a couple of those IEEE subgroups as well. I am in the IOMT and the research subgroup. So wonderful to have you, Jonathan. Um, anyone else? All right. Let me go ahead and just get a capture of everyone who's here. And. And where are you located, uh, Jonathan? Forgot to ask. I'm in Chicago. That's right. Okay, great. Um, so for those of you that are new, it doesn't sound like there's anyone who's super new. Um, please consider adding yourself to the membership directory, which is on the screen right now. Um, we have members here just so that if anyone needs to contact you um, or you want your information to be known, this will be the place to have it. I'm right here, as you can see. Um, and here's Rich, so if you consider adding yourself to that, um, that would be great. I do think you need a Linux Foundation ID to get into that, um, and that's really easy to set up if you haven't done that already. Well, the next thing uh, I was going to talk about is, uh, Rich has been talking about this for a while, but the Hyperledger Hyper Global Forum is a huge event. For Hyperledger, um, it's happening March third through sixth in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, is there anyone going to that? I'm I'm planning on going that going to that. Oh, great! Is this John? Yes. Okay. John Walker. Great. Okay. Well, maybe we can get an update for you from you at one of the other meetings. Um, it seems like it's going to be a great event. Um, and then, of course, we have the Hims Conference coming up um, in March. Uh, I was told by Rich that Hyperledger is actually not going to have a group this year at HIMSS, which is kind of surprising. Um, I think it's because they're focusing on the Google Forum. Um, so, but anyways, there is a social event uh, for the Hyperledger and Healthcare Special Interest Group members that I think Rich sent out an email about. Um, if you are going to attend, is anyone on the call going to be at HIMSS? Okay. Well, that will be a big conference, as we all know. Um, and then also, uh, is there any announcements that anyone would like to share with the community um, for updates on what they're working on, um, 
some of the business stuff that that people are uh, any progress people are making or any interesting updates for the group. Tell this is Jonathan. So one thing I've been working on in the IEEE identity subgroup has been um, immunization records, and um, I have the specification done, and we're still uh, waiting to get some feedback. But I'd be happy to share. Um, mostly just for cross pollination um, between different, because there's uh, each standard has standard bodies, and I think the more we can cross pollinate and actually get feedback. So the the data model actually uses uh, verifiable credentials, which is a specification coming out of the W3C. But the sort of the payload and the uh, evidence, the data actually is in uh, HL7 Fire. And so I certainly would appreciate some, some feedback to see if I'm am I totally off base as far as this approach. Um, there is some concern as far as what we leak uh, in the patient health uh, PHI uh, that maybe could be done better. I'll put the link in the chat. Okay, great. And is this something that you're preparing for the IEEE group in a document, or are you just getting feedback on your approach? Yeah, so the data model is actually mostly coming through the W3C, and the, the schemas would be hosted. Um, well, that's the, the question is actually, which standards body does this really belong in? So the IEEE, as you probably know, is that there's a lot of, um, um, they, they make their money by copywriting the their their, their material, but the, I, I think the, the data model actually shouldn't be copyrighted, but probably the implementation guide that actually accompanies it, that actually for IEEE members is actually what, what would be proprietary to that group. But, um, but the data model itself, I think, is uh, it should be free and available and open source. And mm -hmm. I think the question is really, like, who hosts these, uh, the authoritative source of uh, something called JSON-LD or the JSON schemas? Okay, great. Um, we've had, you know, in my groups that I've been involved in, we've had some questions, uh, maybe similar, maybe not, on just exactly what we're providing. And some of the groups I'm in, um, we're just providing links to what's already out there um, to show people where to find things and then filling in the gaps um, where standards have not been set. Um, but we still aren't 100% sure who our audience is in some cases. So um, if you have any feedback on that, or if you know anything we don't know, that would be great because we're not quite sure exactly, for example, in the research group, um, if we're targeting you know, pharmaceutical companies, individual researchers, institutions, who's actually looking at this content, who will be looking at this content. That's some of the struggles that we were trying to get addressed by the larger group. But I think from the, Jonathan, I think from the, uh, I'm working with the, uh, the patient subgroup, we'd certainly be interested in um, your, your work and any you know proposals uh, that you have out there because i'll be clearly identity uh and where that um exactly as you, as you said where that's hosted and, and what the format of that exchange is is um very relevant to some of the discussions we're having yep yeah exactly and i think um the, the way that really it's it with the uh, verifiable credentials is actually it's really the idea of a self-sovereign digital identity so mm -hmm. that patients and or providers actually have their own identity. And it, but it's really still, I struggle with, um, you know, in, in who owns your, let's say your vaccine. The reason why I started with the vaccination records is that um, when I used to teach uh, uh, at university, uh, the, the, the met graduate students, um, it's like the hello world of a health record is always like a vaccination record because there's so much there to unpack and as people can understand it. The vaccination records are also very much decentralized so you don't get all your vaccinations from one healthcare system so you get it all over the world uh, you know I've, I've had vaccinations you know in, in other countries so how so it really is like um but how do you actually have that as proof if you actually bring it to another doctor how would they trust that you indeed had a typhoid show you know so 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 i think that's um the where i started with it but also has to do with uh, physician identities. So how does a, how do you actually see the signature from that vaccination and say, oh, you you know you got that vaccination in Kenya, and that physician is a duly licensed physician, and what's the authoritative source of truth that you actually can independently verify the, their credentials? So there's a lot to unpack, and I think it's, um, but the where basically the the model is done, and um, I just need some more feedback. Uh, and unfortunately, the verifiable credentials uh, is sort of on hold right now with the W3C. It's in transition. 
um, and standards take a long time to mature. And so this is um, sort of, I think, uh, the first pass at it. And, and we basically throw some st stuff up and see if it sticks. Great. Sounds very, obviously, it's been very relevant. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for sharing. I was just going in my head of all the vac vaccination times that I've gone through all the way from, you know, when you're little through college and like you said, in other countries. So um, it would be great to, to streamline that somehow. Um, okay. So next. Um, oh, really quick. Uh, I don't use the number two channel, but um, I, I would like to use it more. Uh, it's a really good way to stay engaged with the community. Um, so if you, uh, if anyone else uses it, that would be great. And you can make comments and put posts like the one that you just did, Jonathan, on there uh, for, for feedback. Um, the next thing we'll do is the subgroup updates. Uh, and uh, we'll start with the patient uh, member subgroup. Do we have someone uh, on the call from this group? Um, yes, I'm on, I don't think... I don't see Dennis on the call. Yeah, he usually uh, is on, on all the calls, so I'm surprised to not see him. But um, if you could give an update on just uh, any progress you've made, where you guys are at, that would be great. Sure, so um, we're working on a, uh, a POC um, that demonstrates uh, the a comparative demonstration between the sawtooth uh, network and a fabric network for e-consent. So, uh, we're basically the, the team is um we'd like to present our, our progress at the at the global forum i don't think we'll be doing a, a session or anything but maybe a birds and feather one kind of sidebar sessions um but that's basically our goal is to to uh, have kind of a um you know a, a, a point one uh poc ready uh with uh, use case documentation behind that for the uh, the global forum, so that's where we are. That's what we're working towards. Oh, that's wonderful! Um, sounds like you're we're just starting, but we've we've got some traction and a and a you know, good good team. So that's great, where we're at. great. That's wonderful. Um, okay, so next is the pair subgroup. Hey everyone, this is Ankit again. For uh, anybody who joined a little later, I'm proxying for Ravish Devan today. Uh, update, uh, we, we are reorganizing the group. Um, Ravish had shared this in the previous few meetings. Unfortunately, the participation in, uh, during the last part of last year kind of dwindled and it was not really consistent. So we decided to take a break, uh, reorganize, start afresh in the new year with new times. Uh, maybe it was the time that was not working out for everybody, it was late in the afternoon on Eastern Standard. Uh, so I will be reaching out to schedule a new time uh, for the Zoom meeting. We are targeting to have the meeting on Thursdays at 12 EST. Um, and you will be receiving some communication from us. Again, we, uh, we had engaged with uh, some pair organizations, um, well, with a pair organization in the vision industry uh, over here in Maryland, and they are interested in doing a POC with us. So we're really just trying to get more traction and, and, and a bigger team and more involvement and include more people uh, as we'll be doing some exciting stuff in this year. Okay, great. Thank you. Sometimes it's hard to get things going and um, it's good that you have a plan to uh, set up a new meeting time and kind of try to work with everyone on that. Um, next is the healthcare interoperability subgroup. Uh, is Stephen on the call? No, I don't see Stephen on the call. It's Bob Coley uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, hi, Bob. Hi. We, uh, had one new member join, very interesting and exciting in a way from Mexico, uh, Guillermo uh, Diaz uh, on our last call uh, on Mon Monday this week. Uh, but, and uh, uh, he is tied in with, uh, 
with the whole Mexican uh, phenomenon of trying to get electronic health records, EHRs and PHRs, into Mexican doctors and offices and hospitals. So it's like a blank slate compared to what's happened in America since 2009 and the 31 or more billion dollars, uh, you know, subsidizing doctors and hospital uh, centralized uh, uh, EHR, PHR systems. Um, uh, now, I don't know why Steve, I, I thought Steve was going to be able to be on this one, uh, but, but basically this subgroup is, is focusing on how clinical artifacts can be stored in the blockchain in a semantically interoperable way and the policies and assets and consensus process needed to guarantee semantic interoperability. So it's focusing uh, of the four levels of interoperability, uh, it's focusing on the semantic level. Um, and I am not a computer engineer. I was in you know, a private practice of internal medicine and gastroenterology in Rhode Island for 38 years and uh, retired in, in 205. But um, I've always been a technology enthusiast and uh, I just couldn't miss the new blockchain superimposed on decent, on centralized database systems that I had, you know, uh, encountered in my, uh, in my medical career. So that's, that is the, you know, I think that's promising that we've got another young person uh, and, and who has connections throughout Mexico and also is partnering with, uh, uh, sounds like EHR, PHR vendors in, in California. Uh, so he's very enthusiastic and uh, we're looking for new, <laughs> we're looking for additional engineering types that want to get involved in this, in this subgroup. Uh, and uh, we've talked with Rich, uh, repeatedly as, as has uh, Stephen. Um, and I think the process of, uh, of recruiting members of these subgroups is not yet fully refined. And, um, you know, and any, any help that might come from the members who are attending this meeting uh, would be appreciated. Great, thank you, Dr. Coley. Um... Yeah, if there's anyone on the call uh, who's interested, uh, please contact uh, Stephen Elliott or, um, or Bob. Um, thanks so much for the update. Thank you. Okay, um, the next, uh, next we'll talk about the ad hoc teams. I'm gonna speak on behalf of Rich um, for the Wiki redesign team. Um, we're rather looking for someone who has great ideas to improve this so we can increase access uh, to the Healthcare Special Interest Group site. Um, it's still a suboptimal, um, and so we were just wondering uh, anyone with confluence experience um, could step in and evaluate. Um, and if anyone's interested, I think there was someone on the last call who spoke up. Um, anyone's interested, uh, let, let Rich know. Uh, is there anyone on the call from the academic research team? Okay, and then the next team is the use case uh, development team, and that's that's my team. Um, I just am getting this revamped and started. Um, I've got four members uh, who have responded. Um, I'm get, just getting ready to set up some meetings. And uh, Wendy Charles had set up a wonderful um, example of a very well done use case. Um, we're really trying to get more in depth details um, in our writing when we present these use cases. And, they're going to be just the my chain, medical records, credentialing, and tenor. Um, and really the goal um, is to develop high quality and compelling use cases that will inform healthcare stakeholders and other interested parties on applicability of blockchain, um, specifically hyperledger and healthcare. We're going to use guidance from medical journals and provide current references to support our use cases. And we will collaborate with other groups and general members and potentially other standards groups, including IEEE, um, and other blockchain and healthcare companies to ensure proper representation of these cases. I'll be setting a meeting up in the next few weeks for that. Um, and the, the group members are Patty and Dennis, me, and one other member. Um, 
red. So thank you everyone for, um, for being involved. If anyone is interested in participating in any of those use cases, has any knowledge around there, or would like to do some research, um, please let me know. Okay, the next topic is uh, the survey is live. I took the survey yesterday. Um, let's see here, this is what it looks like. Um, so it's really quick, it took me like five minutes, so we'd really appreciate it. Um, there was an, if you could uh, take the survey, um, it, there was an email sent out with a link to it. Um, it's really just uh, trying to find out where your interests lie, um, who you are, um, what's your activity in the hyperledger space or in the blockchain space, um, what types of blockchains you're interested in hearing about other than hyperledger. So it's a lot of different, uh, different questions around that. So we'd really appreciate it um, if you could go ahead and take that survey um, and give us some feedback so we can make this group better. And here's a link actually right here to it if you are interested. And the survey will remain open until February 14th. So put quite a bit of time to, to give some input for us. And let's see. All right, is there any um, changes that you'd like to see within the group? Any feedback? Uh, this, is a, this is the time to share your thoughts. Okay, um, I would like uh, to- er oh, go ahead. Erica, may I, may I interject one thing? In when we had this new attendant, uh, 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 Guillermo Diaz, uh, I put together, uh, he had just started to look into it. Uh, and Rich. I put, put together a couple of emails to you know point him to the membership directory and the, the chat and the listserv and all. And I just wondered if, uh, if that could be developed to facilitate the onboarding of new members of, of, of the SIG. Kind of like an like a little packet in an email to give give people direction on how to how to well, be, be they, involved. Right. I mean if they if they somehow someone refers them to it, they're all excited and but it is not a simple a trivial thing to uh, to learn where all the links are to, you know, find the right URL for the chat, rocket chat and all. So, uh, you know, I think it would, if it were something you could email to uh, someone to facilitate their understanding the whole thing that's going on in this complex uh, system, um, you know, it, it would, and then they would tell their friends, you know, and it could build the, uh, the membership. Just I agree. Hi. That's a great idea. That's wonderful, wonderful feedback. Um, this meeting is being recorded and Rich is going to listen to everything. So um, I'll pass that along to him. And that's a wonderful idea. I, I agree. I had some some trouble um, when I first started as well, like even finding the link for the Zoom meeting, you know, you have to scroll down and it's in the middle of the Oh, absolutely. And it, yeah. also take, it takes a, it would take a lot of pressure off Rich. In, in recruit in the recruitment task that he uh, that he is supervising, I would think. Right, that he takes on that he yeah, it's a lot. Of, it's definitely a lot of work, and it's a volunteer position, obviously. So, yeah, that that's a great great feedback. Thank you, thank you, Bob. Um, I see uh, quite a few people that have joined the call since we started. Are there is there anyone else, any new members who would like to introduce themselves before um, I get into uh, the next, I, wanted, I was going to speak about the next meeting, um, the next few meetings. We have an interesting speaker coming that I was going to let you guys know about. But um, is there anyone else who wants to introduce themselves? Okay. Um, so not the next. The next meeting is another general meeting, but the meeting after that, the one on the twenty first, we're going to have Ben Parkinson, uh, director of product management at. Uh, Lumadec, which is a healthcare startup recently acquired by Providence Health. Um, he's going to pre present to the group um, on self-sovereign identity management solution and do a live demo using Hyperledger Indy. 
Um, this is going to permit patients to electronically update providers and payers with their member details through secure digital wallet transactions. This is actually, he's going to have a demo at HIMSS. So this, this presentation that he's going to be on February uh, 21st um, is going to be kind of like the same type of presentation that he's going to give at HIMSS. So it's going to be a great, um, great meeting, really exciting, exciting. I actually used to work for Providence Health, so um, it's really interesting and I'm really glad kind of taking this on. Okay, and then our next meeting is another general meeting. Um, are there any topics that anyone would like to add to that agenda um, for our next meeting? So one thing that came up earlier was about this concern about semantic interoperability. And this is again what I'm struggling with as far as where to host um, schema definitions and who, like which standards bodies and I'm still stuck at the, the, the most solutions right now use basically just HTTP hosting um, but there's right. a whole host of uh, challenges of uh, security matters and so and and this is just my, me just voicing my, my concern and frustration because like everything I see is basically like yeah it's blockchain but it's like a blockchain running on Azure or in AWS, and so how, how do we actually, uh, or you know, like Fabric running, uh, you know, and so how do we get away from basically Web 2.0 technologies um, as a layer for basically reinventing all this, this technology we've done over the last 20 years, but then we're still using HTTP. And so, that, and I struggle with that with, uh, with the semantic interoperability right piece right now, which is basically all of our security is still vulnerable to man in the middle attacks and uh, SSL proxy um, uh, uh, forging. So I, I, it's I'm just struggling with. I, I'm a very big advocate for blockchain technologies. I've been in this space for four year plus years now, and I'm a clinician. So and I'm a programmer, and I actually spend my time way down in the weeds parsing binary. And so, but I'm. I'm still stuck at the how insecure it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like you have a lot of background in different things and have, you know, where you're coming from. It makes sense that you have these questions and this, these are great topics to, to bring up. Um, so we can definitely add that as a talking point um, to the next meeting. And if anyone has any feedback or would like to comment on that right now, that would, that would be great as well. Well, uh, Jonathan, I'm, I'm curious about your um, your earlier mention that basically the the SSI right or distributed identity is so that's really being driven by the the W3C, and I would, I mean, I haven't really plugged into that. I understand what SSI is and and uh, the challenges you're describing, but it seems like if the um, that would be the, the top level organization, right? To drive that out and then other standards bodies would um, either adopt or experiment with implementations, right? Of whatever, what direction they're going. And I'm curious if you come, you were saying that that's kind of the ownership of that initiative is on hold right now or in transition. What, do you have any, any insights into that? Yeah, so the working it's a working group in the W3C that actually they're restating their charter. So there's, there's it's, it's interesting because there's also work being done at um, Hyperledger, so Aries, who the presentation next week is going to be about um, self-sovereign digital identity, SSI. And uh, Project Aries has a different spin on things um, with this whole DIDCOM. Basically, it's rewrapping like everything we've done over the last year, which is uh, DNS resolution, um, a TLS for secure um, tr transmission, and basically we're, we're wrapping HTTP in all these other protocols. So, uh, so yeah. So the uh, but un under the um, under the cover is is basically still HTTP, and um, and w we all know that actually it's 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 really insecure. And I spent most of the day yesterday actually, you know, proving this out, which is like really how do you like everyone wants to demo is like oh no we fixed that bug and so. Um, so you basically like can piece together a couple different um, hacks and actually show that like in, uh, from a security standpoint, they're, they're still all very vulnerable to these type of uh, uh, vector approaches. Um, so um, these vulnerabilities. So, um, so yeah, so, so they're, they're not, not just uh, Project Aries or W3C, there's also the DIFF, the Decentralized Identity Foundation, 
Um, in healthcare space, there's, um, uh, if you guys are familiar with uh, the Direct project, and so Direct is uh, basically um, SMTP over a secure certificate. Um, basically, it's email. So actually, like you, you send um, payloads of, of information via email, but there's basically one source of truth of, of the, sec the secure authority of basically who comes from the Direct um, trust. And that's a problem because that's like, that's basically a monopoly. It's not decentralized. It's not um, really um, self-sovereign in any sense. So I guess I'm having an existential crisis and in, in, in now since I've spent uh, years working on this and really dove down into the way, way down in the details and um, have concerns. Is there, I'm curious in the, in the, um, is in the mix with the W3C, is any of the work that um, Berners-Lee is doing with Solid or Inrupt? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so those, that's, those are like um, encrypted data uh, stores right. uh, as being one of many different uh, solutions. Uh, but unfortunately, like, you know, Tim um, uh, really has his head around the HTTP protocol, which he created, right. which is right. the entire W3C consortium is concerned about that one protocol. So everything is about that protocol. So, so I think there it comes with a lot of baggage as far as these, mm -hmm. these standards being developed in a in a standards body that is concerned about one protocol. So, uh, hence, hence why I think there's need for cross pollination and just uh, fresh eyes of making sure we don't reinvent the same vulnerabilities in in these flashy new things we call blockchains, but they're really still just API calls. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Hi, can I just chime in here? My name's Kent. Um, I'm a fabric developer and uh, some ideas on Jonathan's project. So you could think of it as the identity module being front end, and then you wouldn't put the patient name onto the blockchain, but you would have some sort of serial number or code, and then you put some of the patient information so to separate the identity and the information on Fabric, for example. Now, one of the interesting things is that Fabric does not have, um, they does not encrypt the information at the front end. So you might need to encrypt it before it goes onto the chain. And another thing is that we use TLS in Fabric, so that might alleviate some of your concerns. And another interesting option is to use private data collection. So normally with Fabric, we have uh, different nodes, different validators, different endorsers. We call them endorsers, and that might be an, uh, a centralization problem, as in who would endorse the information to go onto the chain. With private data collection, uh, one of the best things is that the user or the patient or the customer, whoever, whoever it is, can actually self-certify that information and put it on without needing uh, a second or third party. So that might be some of some ideas to help you develop your your project. And how do you share the semantics between? So I think my understanding of Fabric is that it's still very much a certificate authority uh, that yes. you spin up and actually like, and you, you have other people co-sign. So that where the trust is actually is basically through your partner. Let's say you have a pharmaceutical company, actually like you, and you have a hospital and you have an EHR. Is that basically you all have to basically cross-sign your certificate authority. So they're self-signed, and you basically. Um, uh, cross sign and that's that's your 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 web well, of trust usually yes but with the private data collection the answer is no so the last part of my answer would be that with private data collection then you can actually uh, self certify the information yourself without needing any second or third party anybody else you can just self certify the information for yourself so private data collection remember those three words might be very helpful for you Okay, and there's a lot of similarities to what we're working on with a self-sovereign digital identity as far as creating these, these standards to do that. But what yeah, about... Yeah, so my, my point really is that putting the identity, separating the identity from the Fabric blockchain. So the data goes on the block, Fabric blockchain and the um, self-sovereign identity is a separate part, probably at, uh, ahead of it. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Well, that was a great discussion. Um, I'm learning a lot. Uh, does anyone else have any comments? Wonderful, and we can continue this too. Um, 
if anyone has comments later, or we can bring also bring this up at the next meeting, as it is also a general meeting and there should be plenty of time to bring up topics like this uh, next time. Does anyone have any uh, closing comments or um, other topics they'd like to discuss before we end uh, about 20 minutes early here? Uh, this is Alicia. Hi, Alicia. Um, uh, nothing, nothing uh, regarding that. Just actually recommending a, a book uh, for very interesting reading. Okay. Uh, it's called uh, The Price We Pay. And it's by uh, Dr. Uh, Marty Macri. And it's a very interesting um, book regarding um you know payers but patients and you know when i'm reading it is i see the amount of potential of you know developing a lot of different things for in healthcare is this written um with regard to the u.s say that again yes okay but Just in the u.s yeah, yeah so yeah for People that are not in the United States, yeah, no, not not really for them. Uh, but it's really regarding healthcare in the United States. And this physician is a physician researcher that works at uh, Job Hopkins. Oh, okay, great, wonderful. Thank, thank you for the recommendation. If you want to put a, a link in the in the chat, that would be great as well. And we will include that in the show in the um, the notes for the meeting as well. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, any comments, uh, updates, questions, topics for discussion for either now or next meeting? All right, well, wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you for letting me stumble through uh, hosting the meeting. And um, we'll see everyone. Our next meeting is February 7th. Um, same time uh, and we're just that. Um, and if there's nothing else, everyone have a wonderful weekend. Um, and thank you. Thank you.